World Around Us, brought to you by Captain Cook. Hello and welcome to the world around us. In this edition, we travel to the coast of the Philippines where fishermen take the help of sodium cyanide to catch fish without killing them. Then it's off to Philadelphia in the United States for a profile of a 12-year-old genius who is on her way to becoming one of the world's greatest violinists. We also visit Seoul in South Korea where a Buddhist monk is traveling through cyberspace to reach Nirvana. But first, we find out why South Africa is once again earning the gruesome reputation of being the murder capital of the world. Rocky Street in the Yeovil district of Johannesburg is crawling with Hell's Angels. And it should be. The street's merchants pay them to be there. On a street where drugs are traded openly, a small underpaid local police force seems to be losing the battle against crime. Mike Howell is the president of the Johannesburg Hells Angels. I perceive it as a job uh, given us to do which we accept it and we'll do it well. Some people perceive my existence as drastic. It's incidental to me, you know. Their mere presence seems to deal with what Howell calls little annoyances. And we clearly have made a difference and I think they accept that and appreciate it, you know. People respect each other's company uh, and, and property. Uh, people don't, uh, you don't park your car there and have it ripped off. You don't uh, sit down in a coffee shop and find yourself uncomfortable. Uh, you pretty much come there to spend your money to have a good time and we ensure that that's what you can do. Yeovil is just one community in a country where someone is murdered every 29 minutes. South Africa is once again set to be named the murder capital of the world. Tired of escalating crime and with what they see as the police's reactive approach, some South African communities like Yeovil are going proactive with vigilantes. In Soweto, a huge black township outside of Johannesburg, 4,000 people have joined a young vigilante group, Soweto Youth Against Crime, who hit the streets to bust criminals. They claim they can fight crime better because unlike the police, they live in the area and know the criminals. Jerry Marabiani is one of the youth leaders. I think I know Soweto better than anyone. And I think I know this area which I'm living in better than anyone. To an outsider, Soweto is a confusing area. During apartheid, street signs were ripped down and many homes changed their street numbers to confuse police. Today, it still works. For the cops, responding to a complaint is often next to impossible. Inspector Pragason Naidu set foot in Soweto for the first time just a month ago. He and his partner have spent the last two hours looking for a house where a caller reported a burglary in progress. I can find my way around, but uh, not very well. I don't know the, the deep streets in Soweto. Naidu is typical. Most police don't come from Soweto, and few speak any of the African languages used in the township. Jesse Duarte, the province's Minister of Safety and Security, defends having non-black cops in all black areas. I'm determined in this province not to fall into the trap of, of Western thinking and white apartheid thinking that we should have white cops in white areas and black cops in black areas and use the language issue as an issue. Because sooner than, than later, the, the, the right-wing Afrikaner people are then going to say they only want white African-speaking, blonde, blue-eyed young men to police their areas. And that trap I will never fall into, I must just say honestly to you. The politically correct decision leaves white cops like 22-year-old Sergeant Heinrich Moritz and 21-year-old Constable Morris Hanacombe feeling vulnerable. For them, policing Soweto is dangerous and difficult. They put their life on the line for the meager amount of just over $300 a month and jokingly refer to their job as volunteer work.
They go into the township heavily armed. This is a 9 millimeter. This is the R5. That's the R1 over there. And this is the stopper. This is the ammunition used for the stopper. You get tear gas and rubber. But Moritz says they still are not armed well enough against criminals who carry everything from hand grenades to AK-47s. Under the circumstances, it's not surprising that the cops seem to spend most of their time on relatively safe police work, like looking for stolen cars. So the community turns to Youth Against Crime to fight other criminals. In contrast to the police, members of Youth Against Crime are unarmed and put their lives on the line whenever they bust suspects. And they have another problem. Criminals see them as impimpies or police spies, making them vulnerable to retribution. In the past few months, two of their leaders have been gunned down by gang members. Cynthia Nombulela McClana's son, Lawrence, was given an award for arresting a rapist who had eluded police for months. An hour after the suspect posted bail, Lawrence was shot six times on his way to a night shift with Youth Against Crime. Now she lives in fear. Her family's lives are threatened daily by her son's alleged murderer, who is once again out on bail. Terror is a feeling shared by many in this community, including McClana's neighbors. 19-year-old Shelton Dodo in Yachty was harassed daily by local thugs who wanted him to join their gang. Now he says they're trying to kill him. Dodo didn't go to the police. He reported the criminals to the vigilantes, who meet out their own kind of punishment. Of course I know. This guy is going to get them. Listen. The teenagers say they have to use violence against violent criminals. If he didn't want to give us the gun, and we know that he've got the gun, obvious with us, there's no, we have no option. But we have to clap him till he gives us the gun, and then we hand in over the gun together with him because he was not cooperative from the start. But Jerry Marobiani has been charged with attempted murder, and six other members of his group face assault charges. And the police say the vigilantes don't do much to fight crime. We've got the training. They can go and catch the guys. They haven't got the training. They can't take the law in their own hands. Minister Duarte disagrees. She says Youth Against Crime may have had some successes, but she dislikes their methods and wants to train them as police reservists. I still think the, the option that, that we need to struggle with is the one which would reorientate them towards an acceptance of um, a civil base rather than a paramilitary base, which is really where their minds are at the moment. In a sense, Youth Against Crime has become another gang on the streets. 20-year-old Walter Melisela, who was wanted by police for murder and robbery, was gunned down in the street. His fellow gang members say he was killed by youth against crime. The organization denies it. Today, he and 18 other youths are buried side by side in numbered graves. It's not clear whether vigilante groups are reducing or even increasing the level of crime. But in today's South Africa, people are desperate enough to put their trust in vigilantes instead of the police. This is Sarah Carter reporting. You probably know that cyanide is a deadly poison, but cyanide being used to catch fish that too are alive, that's exactly what fishermen in the Philippines have been doing for 30 years now. Cyanide on its own may be lethal, but it's rendered harmless in seawater. So instead of killing the fish, the chemical merely stuns them. It's just what the fishermen need to catch the fish alive. Export of live fish is a booming business in the Philippines. Cyanide, therefore, may be the fishermen's favorite bait, but for the coral reefs on the Philippine coast, the chemical is proving fatal. This man is looking for treasure, live tropical fish to sell to pet shops in America, Europe, and Japan. His tools are simple the length of hose, an air compressor, 
and a bottle of cyanide. Sodium cyanide is used for refining gold and other metals, but in the Philippines, fishermen have been using it for more than 30 years. Cyanide is a deadly poison, but it's quickly diluted in seawater. The idea is not to kill the fish, but to stun them. Marine ecologist John McManus says cyanide fishing may have started in the Philippines, but now it's spreading across Asia and the Pacific. Cyanide is a good thing if you're a fisher trying to make a quick buck uh, and trying to catch live fish. It's not all that easy to catch a live fish. So if you've got something that will stun the fish, then and that, that makes it easy for you to just reach out and grab the fish, and this is a good thing from your standpoint at the time. But a good thing at the time is a bad thing later on. Cyanide may not kill the fish, but it does kill the corals where the fish live and breed. Coral reefs are the most biologically diverse ecosystems on Earth. Isang cherry grouper, mid small. Isang assorted butterfly. Live fish exports are big business. The Philippines supplies up to 75% of all the marine aquarium fish in the world. This facility says it won't accept fish caught with cyanide, but it may be an exception. Vic Albaladejo works for the Philippine Bureau of Fisheries. He's flown from Manila to the southern town of Caron, an emerging battleground in the fight against cyanide. Grouper. Uh, this is what they call in the local dialect as suno. Cyanide fishing began with aquarium fish, but it's getting worse thanks to a food fad in Hong Kong and China. Wealthy Chinese will pay up to $100 for a live grouper in a restaurant fish tank. The fishers don't see much of the money, but they do earn up to five times more for live fish than for frozen. For the consumer, it seems there's little health risk. It takes days or weeks to get the fish from the ocean to the table. By that time, most of the cyanide has passed through the fish's system. Catching cyanide fishers isn't easy. The Philippines alone has more than 25,000 square kilometers of coral reefs. The fishing itself takes place underwater, out of sight. Even if a patrol boat comes, all the fishers have to do is toss the bottles overboard. But some people are trying to intervene. Von Pratt heads the International Marine Life Alliance. He has lobbied the government of the Philippines to make cyanide more expensive and to make penalties for abusing it more severe. The government is beginning to listen. This inspector works for Pratt's group. He has official permission to intercept shipments of live fish at the airport in Manila. His destination is a cyanide detection lab. Training is a crucial part of Pratt's program. He's not against the trade in live fish, but he says cyanide fishers need to learn new ways to catch them. Pratt's group has trained these former cyanide fishers to use hooks and bait instead of poison. People who use cyanide know it's a problem. Okay? They know it's poisonous. They know it's dangerous to handle. Uh, they've all been affected by it, either through skin lesions or you know, getting ill from maybe inhaling it. They know it's illegal. And they see what it does to the, to the marine environment. It's easy to see why many fishers still prefer cyanide. It's taken about two hours to catch this one fish, and it's barely big enough to sell. This is a village of aquarium fishers in the northern Philippines. Noel Abula is one of the village's most enthusiastic converts. He used to fish with cyanide, but he stopped when he saw the effects it was having on the reefs.
no aquarium fish on a dead coral now. Now I I realized when I am using the net now. No 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 aquarium fish on a dead corals. It's lonely on <laughs> dead coral. Well on a, a live coral this is a plenty of fish there gathering and you are happy to see them. This one, uh, powder brown butterfly, is cost of 20 pesos. And happy for the money they bring. This is long nose butterfly is 20 pesos also. This one is a bird fish, green bird. It costs 50 pesos. The prices range from a few cents to a couple of dollars. It's a decent living in a country as poor as the Philippines. Under pressure from environmental groups, the government of Hong Kong is talking of setting up its own cyanide detection tests and certifying fish imports as cyanide-free. That could be a big step toward ending a poisonous legacy for the reefs of Asia and for the millions of people who depend on them. I'm John Miller reporting. Philadelphia in the United States lives Jessica Linneback. Jessica is learning the violin at the famous Curtis Institute of Music. Jessica is just 12 years old and the youngest student at the institute. That's understandable considering that she began playing the violin when she was just two and a half. And she's already played solo with a number of orchestras in North America. Makes you wonder what you were up to when you were 12, doesn't it? I want to be a concert violinist. That's basically what I've always wanted to do. To tour and play with orchestras. Jessica Linnebach is 12 years old. She's already on her way to becoming one of the world's foremost violinists. Other musicians told us that she had a special gift. I was sort of oblivious to it because it just seemed normal to me. That was her. That's, that's Jessica. Well, Jessica is, is, a, is a tremendously gifted young person. She shows the promise of being a really great violinist. Two years ago, Jessica left her elementary school in Edmonton, Canada, and moved with her mother to Philadelphia, where she now attends the famous Curtis Institute of Music. She studies in the same rooms where greats like Samuel Barber and Leonard Bernstein learn their craft. First of all, tuning is something you're doing for yourself. At age 12, Jessica is the youngest student here. Her teacher, Aaron Rosand, was also a child prodigy at Curtis, and today he's a world famous violinist. Never lose the rhythm. You're dying before it's dead. Understand? Huh? Jessica started playing the violin when she was two and a half, about the same age Isaac Perlman was when he picked up his first violin, younger than Mozart was when he wrote his first piece. By age seven, Jessica had already had her concert debut. Since then, she has played as a soloist with orchestras throughout North America. I don't really remember it, but my parents told me that um, I heard a violinist play, and I just begged my parents to get me a violin. She's so mature and innately musically gifted at such a tender age. And this is the talent that we speak about. There is a lot that we really don't know, the innate qualities with, with, with which one is born. I think in many, many cases, uh, there are uh, young people, who you might say, that have been here before, you know, maybe in spirit or soul. And of course, one must understand that it's 10% talent and 90% work. I practice about four to five hours a day, four hours a day, probably. Every yeah, day? Every day. Seven days a week? Seven days a week. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's like torture, but a lot of the time it's just like something I have to do. This is uh, our family. 
Nadia, our younger daughter, is in Edmonton with uh, my husband Wolfram. And the price of Jessica's genius is that she's had to leave her father and sister behind in Edmonton. When she was accepted, it was a, a major decision for us to make because then we had to commit ourselves to um, living apart. Jennifer, Jessica's mother, had to give up a good career as a biologist in Canada to manage her daughter's career. Now, she spends her afternoons teaching junior high school at home. She even sits in on Jessica's violin lessons. Speaking is ba, 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 ba. Longer first chord. Since I'm a non-musician, my, uh, my notes are definitely those of a non-musician. You know, I... You know, for example, go noodle section as opposed to section C or something like that. <laughs> yeah, this is Sibelius. You have to think of the Finnish landscape. You know anything about Finland? Mm, kind of. What do, you, what do you mean kind of? What is kind of? What, is, what do you know about Finland? Where is it? Well, it's... Geographically speaking. Well, it's... It sounds it's like, like you don't know very much about no, it. No, I mean, it's in right Norway, right? Okay. Begin now and let me hear a sound from the grim north Finland. But Professor Roseanne has to teach a lot more than just geography. He has to turn this 12-year-old into a mature artist. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Naturally, you don't feel at 12 what you might feel at, at 24 and 36, etc. Still, I, I do feel a, a, a young talent such as Jessica is born with the innate ability to feel perhaps um, more that one is precocious at this age. It goes beyond simply playing the violin. try to feel the music the way, you know, someone that had experienced those things would actually try to play it. We're up just one last time. Let's make this a profound statement, a 12-year-old profound statement. <laughs> Next season, Jessica will play the Sibelius Violin Concerto with the Philadelphia Orchestra. This is Peter Klein reporting. Good. Flatten, flatten your hair. Good boy. Finally, we catch up with Jong Rim, a monk at the High In Sa, the Buddhist temple in South Korea. Rim has been cruising down the information superhighway in his quest for nirvana. Some 10 years ago, Rim began transferring Buddhist scriptures onto his computer. That task is nearly complete, and the scriptures can now be accessed on the internet. A laborious exercise, that. But Rim appears to be finding it more difficult convincing the older monks about the virtues of technology. The only sound that breaks the silence in the Kaya Mountains is the beating of the drum resonating from Hainsa, the Buddhist temple in South Korea. Listen carefully, and another, much more modern beat will surface. This is Monk Chungnim, the man responsible for linking these two worlds. <laughs> Do you know what my dream is? 
My dream is to get a van, and instead of driving around with a pile of books, I want to drive around the world like a vagabond with just one computer, which is like my other self. <laughs> Zhonglin is very close to making that dream a reality. More than a decade ago, Zhonglin decided it was time to take advantage of modern-day technology and all it had to offer by getting the Buddhist scriptures onto the Internet. Buddhism has been left behind in the developments in modern society. We've never once led the way. Perhaps for once, we will be pioneers of a new frontier and lead the way. This is the Tripikata, a Buddhist canon made up of over 80,000 wooden blocks, delicately handcrafted in the 13th century as a gift to the gods to protect the country from Mongolian invasion. Zhonglin wanted the Tripikata, one of the most comprehensive of all the Buddhist scriptures, to be the first scripture sent into cyberspace. But he first had to devise a system for transferring all of this to this. The laborious task of recreating each Chinese character and then typing it in was begun. And today, more than 10 years later, it is nearly complete. Chongrim came up against an even bigger obstacle, the older and more conservative mindset. Some older monks worried that computerizing Buddhism would degrade it and argued that Buddhism should stay in the realm of the mind. Song Taeyong, a professor of philosophy, thinks that old-school mentality would have kept many modern-day Buddhists in the dark. That is a delusion that knowledge should be monopolized by a certain class. It is important to break that wall and equally distribute Buddhist teachings to everyone. I think it is important for everyone to have access to information. I think people can find reason through information. That is one way to overcome ideology or limits in experience. The ultimate experience for a monk is nirvana, the state of total peace. Conventional Buddhists believe only a very small fraction will ever reach that state. But Chongnim says you may soon be able to tap into nirvana through a modem. This is Jane Lee reporting. That's all in this week's edition of The World Around Us. See you again next week at the same time.